The Authoritative Life of General William Booth Chapter 7 East London Beginning What were Mr. and Mrs. Booth to do? They were excluded from most of the churches in which, during the last twenty years, they had led so many souls to Christ. They found themselves out of harmony with most of the undenominational evangelists of the day, and, moreover, they had experienced throughout even the brightest of their past years annoying dissatisfaction with much of their work, which the general thus described in the prefix to his book in darkest England in the way out. Quote, All the way through my career I have keenly felt the remedial measures usually enumerated in Christian programs and ordinarily employed by Christian uh, philanthropy and to be lamentable, inadequate for any effectual dealing with the despair and miseries of the outclass. outcast classes the rescued are appallingly few a ghastly minority compared with the multitudes who struggle and sink in the open mouth abyss alike therefore my humanity and my christianity if i may speak of them as in any way separate from each other have cried out for some comprehensive method of reaching and saving the perishing crowds unquote. The Booths have settled in a London home, finding that they must needs have some fixed resting place for their children, and that ab abundant opportunities of one kind or another could be found for them both in the metropolis. But the general who was, quote, waiting upon God and wondering what would happen, unquote, to open his way to the unchurched masses, received an invitation to undertake some services in a tent which had been erected in an old burial ground in Ch Whitechapel. The unexpected missioner had fallen ill. He consented, and he thus describes his experiences. Quote, when I saw those masses of poor people, so many of them, evidently without God or hope in the world, and found that they so readily and eagerly listened to me, following their open-air meeting to tent and accepting in many instances my invitation to kneel at the Savior's feet, there and then, my whole heart went out to them. I walked back to our West End home and said to my wife, O Kate, I have found my destiny. These are the people for whom salvation I have been longing all these years. As I passed by the doors of the flaming gin palaces tonight, I seemed to hear a voice sounding in my ears. Where can you go and find such heathen as these, and where is there so great a need for your labors? And there and then in my soul I offered myself and you and the children up to this great work. Those people shall be our people, and they shall have our God for their God. Unquote. Mrs. Booth herself wrote, quote, I remember the emotion that this produced in my soul. I sat gazing into the fire, and the devil whispered to me, This means another departure, another start in life. The question of our support constituted a serious difficulty. Hitherto we had been able to meet our expenses out of the collections which we had made from our most respectable audiences, but it was impossible to suppose that we could do so among the poverty-stricken East Enders, we were afraid even to ask for a collection in such a locality. Nevertheless, I did not answer discouragingly. After a momentary pause for thought and prayer, I replied, Well, if you feel you ought to stay, stay. You have trusted the Lord once for your support, and we can trust him again. Unquote. That night, says the general, the Salvation Army was born. Before long, God moved the heart of one of the most a beloved men in England, Mr. Samuel Morley, to promise them his influence and support without any condition but the continuance of the work thus begun. But no amount of monetary help could have placed the general in a position 
to establish anything like the permanent work he desires. He writes, I had already got successfully started on my new path before my old experiences of difficulty met me once more. On the third Sunday morning, I think it was, we found the old tent which formed our cathedral blown down and so damaged by the fall, as well as so rotten that it could not be put up again. Another tent was impossible as we had no money to buy one. So, as no suitable building could be obtained, there was nothing for it but for us to do our best out of doors. After a time, we secured an old dancing room for Sunday meetings. But there being no seats in it, our converts had to come at four o'clock on Sunday morning to bring the benches in and work till midnight or later still, when the day's meetings were over to move them out again. For our weeknight meetings, we had hired an old shed formerly used to store rags in, and there we fought for months. What a testimony to the character of the work already accomplished and the readiness of the little force already raised to toil like pioneer soldiers for the love of Christ. Most of the converts of those days had been forgiven much. The following letter from one of them may give some idea both of the nature of the work done and the surrounding circumstances. Dear Sir, I have reason to bless the hour that God put the thought into our heart to open the mission at the east end of London, for it has been the means of making me and my family happy. In the love of Christ, it has turned me from a drunkard, bastard, and liar to a true believing Christian. At the age of thirteen, I went as a waited boy in a public house where I remained until I was sixteen. Here I learned to love the flavor of drink, and I never lost it until I was converted to God, through the blessed works spoken in the open air. When I look back and think how I have beaten my poor wife, it was through the drink it made me ashamed of myself. It was the word and the blow, but sometimes the blow first. After I got sober, sometimes it would make me ashamed to look at her black eyes, but I do thank God there is no fear of black eyes now, and we are very happy together. I am a stoker and engine driver, and I wonder I have never had an explosion, for I have been drunk for a week at a time. On one occasion I have been drunk overnight and was not very sober in the morning. I went to work at half past five instead of five, and without looking to see if there was any water in the boiler, I began stroking the fire up. The fright sobered me. It cost about 100 pounds before it was fit for work again. But that did not alter me, only for the worst. I broke up my home. I got worse after that and cared for nothing. Half my wages went in drink and my wife was afraid to speak to me and the poor children would get anywhere out of my way. Afterwards, I was discharged. But although I soon got another job, I could not leave off the drink. I was reckoned a regular drunker. I lost place after place and was out of work several weeks at a time for they did not care to employ a drunkard. Still, I would have beer somehow. I did not care how. I have given one and sixpence for the loan of a shilling, and though there was not a piece of bread at home, the shilling went in beer. I have often had the police called in for ill-using my wife. On one occasion she ran down to her mother's with her face bleeding, but I went to bed. When I woke, I saw she was not there, so I went out and got drunk. I came home and got a large carving knife, put it up my sleeve, and went down to her mother's with the intention of killing her. But they saw the knife. The police were called in, and I was taken to Spatfield's station. But no one coming to press the charge, I got off. Eight years ago, God thought fit to lay me on a bed of sickness for thirteen weeks and I was given up by all the doctors. When I got better, people thought I would alter my life and become a steady man, but no, I was as bad as ever. While I was at work another time, drunk, I lost one of my eyes by an accident. But even that did not make me a sober man, nor make me leave off swearing and cursing. I was generally drunk two or three times on Sunday. 
The Sunday that I was convicted, I was a sinner. I had been drunk twice. And I did not think there was much happiness for me. But I do thank God for what he has done for me. He has changed my heart. He has filled me full of love of Christ. And my greatest desire is to tell sinners what a dear Savior I have found. Best of all was the demonstration that out of such material, God was able and ready to raise up a fighting force. One great difficulty of those days was the obtaining of suitable buildings. For a time, a theater was hired for Sunday meetings. The law in England then not allowing theaters to give performances on Sundays. The great buildings to which the people have been accustomed to go for amusement have always proven admirably suitable for the gathering of congregations of that sort. A gentleman who had had long experience in mission work thus describes what he saw when he went to spend a Sunday afternoon with William Booth. On the afternoon of Sunday, January 31st, I was able to see some of the results of William Booth's work in the East of London by attending his experience meeting held in the East London Theatre. About two o'clock, some of his helpers and converts went out from the mission hall where they had been praying together and held an open-air meeting in front of a large brewery opposite the hall. The ground was damp and the wind high, but they secured an audience and then sang hymns along the road till they came to the theater, taking in any who chose to follow them. Probably about 500 were present, though many came in late. The meeting commenced at three and lasted one hour and a half. During this period, 53 persons gave their experience, parts of eight hymns were sung, and prayer was offered by four persons. After singing Philip Phillips' beautiful hymn, I will sing for Jesus. Prayer was offered up by Mr. Booth and two others. A young man rose and told of his conversion a year ago, thanking God that he had been kept through the year. A Negro of the name of Burton interested the meeting much by telling of his first open-air service, which he had held during the past week in Radcliffe Highway, one of the worst places in London. He said when the people saw him, kneel in the gutter, engaged in prayer for them. They thought he was mad. The verse, Christ now sits on Zion's hill. He receives poor sinners still. And then, song. A young man under the right-hand gallery, having briefly spoken, one of Mr. Booth's helpers, a Yorkshire man with a strong voice and a hearty manner, told of the open-air meetings, the opposition they encountered, and his determination to go on, in spite of all the opposition from men and devils. A middle-aged man on the right, a sailor, told how he was brought to Christ during his passage home from Colombo. One of the Dublin tracts entitled John's Difficulty was the means of his conversion. A young man to the right, having told how as a backslider, he had recently been restored. A cabman said he used to be in the public houses constantly, but he thanked God he ever heard William Booth, for it led to his conversion. Three young men on the right then spoke. The first, who comes five miles to these meetings, told how he was lost through the drink and restored by the gospel. The second said he was unspeakably happy. The third said he would go to the stake for Christ. A middle-aged man in the center spoke of his many trials. His sight was failing him, but the light of Christ shone brightly in his soul. The chorus, Let us walk in the light, was then sung. A young man described his feelings as he had recently passed the place where he was born and his sister spoke of her husband's conversion and how they were both now rejoicing in God. After a young man on the left had told how his soul had recently revived, another on the right testified to the Lord's having pardoned his sins in the theater on the previous Sunday. Two sailors followed. The first spoke of his conversion through reading a track while on his way to the Indies four months ago. The other said he was going to see next week and was going to take some Bibles, hymns, and tracts with him to see what could be done for Christ on board. The verse, I believe I shall be there, 
and walk with him in white, was then sung. A young man of the name of John, sometimes called Young Hallelujah, told of the trials while selling fish in the streets, but he covered himself by saying, "'Tis better on before." He had been drawn out in prayer at midnight on the previous night, and had dreamed all night that he was in a prayer meeting. He was followed by a converted thief who told him he was picked up, and of his persecutions daily while working with twenty unconverted men. A man in the center who had been a great drunkard said, What a miserable wrench I was till the Lord met with me. I used to think I could not do without my pint a day, but the Lord pulled me right bang out of the public house into a place of worship. He was followed by a young man who was converted at one of the breakfast meetings last year, and who said he was exceedingly happy. Another young man on the left said his desire was to speak more and work more for Jesus. Two sisters then spoke. The first uttered a brief, inaudible sentence, and the second told of being so happy every day and wanting to be more faithful. The verse, Shall we meet beyond the river, where the surges cease to roll, was then sung. A young woman said, I well remember the night I first heard Mr. Booth preach here. I had a heavy load of sin upon my shoulders, but I was invited to come on the stage. I did so, and was pointed at Jesus, and I obtained peace. Another told of his conversion by a track four years ago on his passage to Sydney. To my sorrow, he said, I became a backslider, but I thank God he ever brought me here. That blessed man Mr. Booth preached, and I gave my heart to God afresh. I now take tracks to sea regularly. I have only eighteen shillings a week, but I save my tobacco and beer money to buy tracks. The verse, I shall never forget that day when Jesus took my sins away, was then sung. A stout man, a navy, who said he had been one of the biggest drunkards in London, having briefly spoken, was followed by one known as Jeremy the Butcher, who keeps a stall at the Whitechapel Road. Someone had cruelly robbed him, but he found consolation by attending the Mission Hall prayer meeting. Two young lads, recently converted, having given their experience a dock laborer converted seventeen months ago, asked the prayers of the meeting for his wife, yet unconverted. Some of his comrades during the last week said, What a difference there is in you now to what there used to be. Three young women followed. The first spoke but a sentence or two. The desire of the second was to live more to Christ. The third had a singularly clear voice and gave her experience very intelligently. It was a year and a half since she gave her heart to the Savior, but her husband does not yet see with her. Her desire was to possess holiness of heart and to know more of the language of Cana. The experience of an old man who next spoke was striking. Mr. Booth had announced his intention some time back of preaching a sermon on the Derby, at the time of the race that goes by that name. This man was attracted by curiosity, and when listening compared himself to a broken-down horse. This sermon was the means of his conversion. The verse then sung was, Can you tell me what ship is going to sail? Oh, the old ship of Zion, hallelujah. Two sisters then spoke. The first had been very much cast down for seven or eight weeks, but she comforted herself by saying, "'Tis better on before." The second said it was two years since she found peace, and she was very happy. A young man told how his sins were taken away. He worked in the city, and someone took him to hear the Reverend E. P. Hammond. He did not find peace there, but afterwards, as the young man was talking to him in the street, he was able to see the way of salvation and rejoice in it. He used to fall asleep generally under the preaching, but here he says under Mr. Booth I can't sleep. A little boy, one of Mr. Booth's sons, the present general, gave a simple and good testimony. He was followed by a young man and then an interesting blind girl, whom I had noticed singing hardly in the street, told of her conversion. A girl told how she had found peace. Seventeen months ago, and then Mr. Booth offered a few concluding observations and prayed. 
and meeting close by singing, I will not be discouraged, for Jesus is my friend. Such is a brief outline of the most interesting meeting held Sunday after Sunday. Mr. Booth led the singing by commencing the hymns without even giving them out. But the moment he began, the bulk of the people joined hardly in them. Only one or two verses of each hymn were sung as a rule. Most of them are found in his old and admirably compiled songbook. I could not but wonder at the change which had come over the people. The majority of those present, probably nearly 500, owed their conversion to the preaching of Mr. Booth and his helpers. How would they have been spending Sunday afternoon if this blessed agency had not been set on foot? In the evening I preached in the Oriental Music Hall, High Street Popular, where five or six hundred persons were assembled. This is one of the more recent branches of Mr. Booth's work and appears to be a, uh, in a very prosperous condition. I found two groups of the helpers singing and preaching in the streets who were only driven in by the rain just before the meeting commenced inside. This is how the people are laid hold of. Shall this good work be hindered for the want of a few hundred pounds? The supply of pounds, alas, though called in for in such religious periodicals as at that time were willing to report the work, did not come, and the general says, after six years hard work, we had nothing better for our Sunday night meetings than a small covered alley attached to a drunk drinking saloon, together with some old discarded chapels and a tumble-down penny theater for week weeknights. At last, the drinking saloon, the Eastern Star, having been burnt out, was acquired and rebuilt and fitted for a center for the work to be succeeded ere long by the large covered People's Market at, in Whitechapel Road, which was for ten years to be the Army's headquarters, and which is now the headquarters of its Englishmen's social work. Throughout all these years of struggle, however, the converts were being drilled and fitted for the further extension of the work. The idea of forming them into a really permanent organization only came to their leader gradually. He says, my first thought was to constitute an evangelical agency, the converts going to the churches. But to this, there were three main obstacles. One, they would not go where they were, were sent. Two, they were not wanted when they did go. Three, I soon found that I wanted them myself. And the more time he spent among them, the more the sense of responsibility with regard to them grew upon him. He had discovered what minds of unimaginable power for good were to be found amongst the very classes who seemed entirely severed from religious life. There they were, and if only proper machinery could be provided and kept going, they could be raised from their present useless, if not pernicious, life to that character of usefulness to others like themselves for which they were so well qualified. They could thus become a treasure of priceless value to their country and to the world. On the other hand, neglected, or left with no other sort of worship than, as yet existed, to appeal to them, they must needs become worse and worse, more and more hostile to religion of any kind, more and more unlikely ever to take an interest in anything eternal. The general could not, therefore, but feel more and more satisfied that he had begun a work that ought to be permanently maintained and enlarged as opportunity might arise until it could cope with the state of things wherever it was to be found. And now that he had at length a center to which he could invite all his helpers from time to time, there was no hindrance to the carrying out of such a purpose. With the establishment of a headquarters that cost £3,500 in one of the main thoroughfares of East London, we may look upon the general as having at last got a footing in the world. End of chapter 7, having been read by Peter John Parisius.